Hi, my name is Christoph Stork, and there is a revolution happening with land seismic data. We can use five to ten times more sources and receivers at nearly the same cost as five years ago. So this is 25 to 100 times more data. And this is great, but it's not enough. It alone won't solve our problem. Just ask Saudi Aramco. There is also a big change happening in our understanding of scattered noise. And this is the problem noise in about 70% of land seismic data and occurs around the world. So I would like to share with you my thoughts on how we can use these additional sources and receivers to better target the scattered noise. Here's an example of some of the revolutionary new receiver hardware. This is a smart solo unit with a self-contained battery, recording unit, GPS, and geophone. And here in the snow, we compare it with some older equipment with a separate battery and recording unit and associated cables. Um, pretty soon there will be some other hardware available. This is BP's Nimble node, and it's about the size of a geophone. And it also contains battery, recording unit, GPS, and an accelerometer. Um, and you can see it can be held in your hand very easily. And, and this will allow number of channels to go up to 100,000 and possibly even more. And it especially allows for more creative acquisition. So there are three theories of land seismic acquisition to address noise. I'm going to review two older approaches and then propose a third approach. The first older approach, and this existed perhaps 30 years ago, was dense linear spacing of sources and receivers to aid velocity filtering, which is generally applied in source and receiver gathers. And this is useful for slow noise traveling directly from the source to the receiver. Number two is broad azimuthal and offset coverage to aid statistical filtering. This has become popular in the last 20 years and still is popular. Um, this helps 5D interpolation, compressive sensing, interpolation, TFD, which is a type of spectral editing, statistical spectral editing, especially throwing away outliers or sometimes you could call it throwing away inconvenient noise components. Finally, number three, I'm proposing to optimize both deterministic filtering and statistical filtering using irregular sampling. And now we have enough sources and receivers to be able to do that. And there's a big benefit to this because this helps scattered noise identification and correction. And scattered noise is often the dominant noise harming the data. And much land scattered noise is actually distorted signal. And we treat it as noise. But the interesting thing here is if we can convert that distorted signal back to normal signal, even partially, that that's a big win. Now, combining these two methods, deterministic and statistical, actually has some synergy. Statistical signal enhancement works best when the noise is fully random. The problem is, is the noise is generally not fully random. Deterministic noise attenuation works best by taking advantage of the patterns in the data. And patterns are the opposite of random. So each method works on different types of noise and are complementary. And I think you should optimize your acquisition for both types. One complication is that the patterns can be complex and difficult to find, but we're making good progress on this. So here's an example of number one, dense linear spacing of sources and receivers. Um, the spacing between the lines is not as important as spacing within the lines. And this is useful for slow noise traveling directly from the source and receiver. And sample acquisition parameters are down here. 41 and a quarter spacing, 990 foot spacing between lines.
And here's an example of what that does to you. Here is 50 meter sampling. And here with five meter sampling, you can see what was some disorganized noise, surface waves and guided waves now becomes nicely organized. And actually a velocity filter would be very effective at removing both of these types of noise. Unfortunately, a lot of noise is not this smooth and easily removed with velocity filters. Here's some example of guided waves that have a lot of irregularity. They have amplitude variations, they come and go. Um, you can see some irregularities here. So velocity filters won't do very well. And if you use an aggressive velocity filter, you'll end up hitting some signal. Now there are some new filtering methods that can handle this irregularity. Um, but for the moment, this, that's why, it, what, this is one of the old problems with velocity filtering. So here we look at acquisition approach number two. This is broad azimuthal and offset coverage to aid statistical filtering. So spacing between your lines, tight spacing between your lines is more important than tight spacing within the lines. And the idea is to randomize the noise the most by spreading out locations. Some sources and receivers will be in good data areas and others in bad data areas. And the bad data is removed by statistical methods. An example of this might be 124 foot spacing within, between, within the lines and 495 foot spacing between the lines. You may have seen this type of azimuth offset distribution plots for the two different theories. So velocity filtering optimized has tight spacing within a line, but then farther line sp spacings. And then the number two approach, which is more statistical filtering optimized, spreads out the data more. So your more, your offset and your azimuths are more distributed. And this is what statistical filtering wants. Now statistical filtering is very powerful, and here's some examples of that, but it's also imperfect. So this shows you the power of statistical filtering. This is your input data, and I think you can see some signal here. This is a common shop gather, and you can especially see this strong event here. So and here we're comparing four different statistical filtering approaches. And for the moment, I, I call this moderately noisy data. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna explain what FWC is later. So you can see a lot of similarities between these approaches. This event down here, this strong event is consistent on all of them. Um, and a lot of these events up here are consistent and some of the ones down here. You can see these later two are, are uh, I would say better. FX, Y, DCON, this is really a 3D statistical filtering. It, it kind of works, but it's not great. Now let's apply the same methods with bad data. This is actually the same gather as before, but the data has not been corrected. And that's where the FWC process comes in that I'll talk about later. Um, this is actually more raw data. And you can see the statistical filtering methods. Well, the first two pretty much fail. The last two seem to pick up this strong reflector down here. You might see it a little bit here. And they pick up some reflectors here. Um, some of this is suspicious. And let's compare the previous slide to this one. And even though this is really the same shop gather, there are actually significant differences. And you can see for this very noisy data, the statistical filtering methods are being, well, they're being pushed to their limits. And both of these last two methods actually work in five dimensions. Now let's try something else here. Here is the same as the previous slide, except 
In this offset range, uh, the data is replaced by pure random noise. So this is the previous and this is the new with the random noise. And you can see these two methods over here, I mean, they're aggressive statistical methods. They will create signal. It will try to extract signal wherever it can. And, and they've done that. It's you know, purely fake signal. It might make you also suspicious of some of the near offsets in this bad data filtering. But this shows you the power, the imperfection, and the danger of statistical filtering. And so some comments here is, I, I think statistical filtering really is somewhat of an art. These methods are based on assumptions about the noise, and we can argue whether those assumptions are proper or not. And you can tune and tweak these methods, and that's fine, and some are better than others. These methods are powerful, and they can produce fake signal, as I showed, but you don't really know when they produce fake signal. They also can do funny things with subtle parts of the data, and subtle parts of the data are important. Things like faults, low and high frequencies, near and far offsets, as a mutual information, and you don't know what's happening to the subtle parts. Is the method being too aggressive? Whether one method is better than another, I don't think it is as important as whether your input data is 3x worse or better than it could be. So it helps to clean up the data with deterministic filtering before statistical filtering. And this is why I think we, they need to work together. Examples of statistical methods are, of course, 5D interpolation, simultaneous source separation, compressive sensing interpolation, and many others. And they all work great until they don't. I also want to point out, some people have mentioned compressive sensing can reconstruct the noise. And that's partially true. They can reconstruct the simple noise, but they cannot reconstruct the complex scattered noise which is the problem noise. So here's a third approach to acquisition, and it's my proposed new approach to optimize both deterministic filtering and statistical filtering using irregular sampling. And this is targeting the scattered noise, which is often the dominant noise by 10x or more. And you may notice here the red of sources and bluer receivers that they all have some cross-line components. And the reason for this is to help resolve cross-line scattering. So we're using dense sampling in 2D patches, but larger spacing between the patches. And here's the concept. Here's the source, and the scattering is coming in from all directions. And to resolve this, we need to have some type of dense spacing in X and Y for the receivers. Now, even with 100,000 or 500,000 receivers, we can't, still can't place them everywhere, but it gives us more flexibility. So for a full survey, this is what the source layout may look like. You see some acquisition holes, but I, I want you to focus on this box where we have some zigzag source lines. Now, so here we have an acquisition a little bit like this that you see here. But instead of a uniform acquisition, we've only put in the zigzag source lines where it's very noisy. Some other areas where the noise isn't very strong, we actually just have linear source lines. And we also have source density varying. The receivers can look like this. Again, variable receiver density, and you see in the box here where it's noisy and we have a lot of scattered noise, uh, we have some cross-line receiver components. So the idea here is we're not abandoning perpendicular source and receiver lines. We're working with them, but we're just enhancing them where need be. 
So the following examples are you going to use um, full waveform correction, FWC. And that's our method for performing deterministic filtering to correct for scattering distortion. Um, FWC is somewhat similar to the FWI process, but it avoids the full FWI process to address the near surface noise. Undoing the near surface scattering effect using full FWI is incredibly expensive. And that's because it requires elastic Q FWI on a half meter grid, 3D grids with incredibly slow velocities. And it turns out this is 10 to the six more expensive than Gulf of Mexico FWI. But you don't need to resolve the near surface on a half meter grid spacing. You can just measure the distortion effect of the near surface and remove it without resolving the near surface to a half meter grid spacing. And this is analogous to statics being handled with, or being handled separate. You could handle statics with velocities in pre-stack depth migration using very small grid spacing. But this is just a very expensive, cumbersome approach, and it's just faster and actually more accurate to handle it separately. Now, land FWI can still address important issues deeper where the velocities are 10 times faster, but we're just saying it's not the best approach for the half meter grid spacing problem. So here is um, a statistical filtering on, on a shop gather. This is similar to what I showed you before. This is without first doing the full waveform correction. Here's the input data. You can see some signal here and here. You can see the various filtering methods seem to bring out some energy, some signal. But let's perform the FWI process on this input data. I think you can see the reflections now more clearly and the statistical methods have now done a much better job. And you see more consistency between the filtering methods. So before and then after, before and after. Here's another shot gather. This is shot gather C, input data and the various statistical methods. And it's nice to use these statistical methods because when they there is some similarity between them. You, you have confidence in them. This is without first doing the full waveform correction and then afterwards. And actually, I'm a little surprised at the differences here. The shallow looks consistent, but the deep has changed. And you can see the reflection is now more obvious on the deep. And then here's our last shot gather um, without first doing FWC um, and then with. You can see the reflections here are now much more clear on the input. So this is input data with FWC and then we subsequently apply statistical filtering and the statistical filtering is able to bring out the signal much more clearly. And again, these last two methods are actually 5D methods. This is just a 3D, and this is, well, halfway in between. So combining deterministic and statistical filtering has power, but we need to apply deterministic filtering before statistical filtering. Statistical filtering relies on signal-to-noise not being too low. If it's too low, it's just going to lock onto the noise and create fake signal. So it's important if you can improve your signal to noise by 5 to 10x with deterministic filtering. I do want to mention you generally can't do effective deterministic filtering after statistical filtering. You should do deterministic filtering first. And you may have heard you should do noise removal before CSI, and that's kind of saying the same thing. That CSI really can't reconstruct the complex noise. 
So new deterministic filtering can handle irregularity. You don't need simple linear noise. And this filtering actually is also aided by the cross-line source and receiver positions. Here's an example of the new deterministic filtering that can handle irregular noise. And this is a shot gather. I think you can see some faint reflections here and here. But the noise has resolved guided waves that have irregularity. And there's also some passive noise here. And all this is is really pattern, searching for patterns. And then the subtraction brings out the reflections a lot better here and here. And I think you can see some other subtle reflections down here and down here. And this is actually using a machine learning algorithm to resolve the irregular patterns. Here's another example of using a full waveform correction on near surface scattering. This is the refraction arrival and we've done a high pass filter and you can see a lot of hyperbolas here. This is the scattering that's occurring at the near surface and when we correct for that scattering, and this is just a partial correction, the arrivals are more continuous, they're here, but also notice the reflections are now. You can see linear reflection events down here and down here whereas you didn't see them over here. Let me explain this full waveform correction process a bit. Uh, here is a heterogeneous near surface. This is 30 to 300 meter feet thick. In the Delaware Basin, it's actually a little bit thicker. Um, and you have strong heterogeneities, and, and these heterogeneities can actually be quite strong. But not only is most of the source energy trapped in the near surface, but then it's scattered. And that creates a very messy source function. Note that the surface velocities are very slow and that important elastic variations happen on a scale less than one meter. And in the big picture, we have here the scattering occurring at the source. You can also have some multiples near the source. And then the scattering occurs again at the receiver and this scattering affects the guided waves, different types of guided waves, and it affects the reflections. So your noise is distorted and your reflections are distorted. So what this does is if you started out with uniform reflections such as on the right, the near surface scattering distorts those reflections to make the energy look like on the left. And you can see this has turned a lot of signal into noise. And the FWC process inverts this and converts the scattered noise back to signal. Here's an interesting example of how scattering can harm land seismic noise quality so dramatically. We start off with a primary signal of 2.0 and other noise of 1. Let's assume we have 50% scattering of the primary energy. And this happens at the source and receiver, so it causes the signal level to be reduced by 25%. It also causes the noise to be increased. And if you work all that out, 50% scattering reduces your signal to noise level by 10x. And we've seen a lot more than 50% scattering. We can measure this. If you have 80% scattering, then the signal to noise level is reduced by 67x. This is a big factor. This is why scattering is such a big problem with land seismic data, and this is why we should address it in acquisition and processing. These are big factors, but many experiences bear this out. And here's some examples. I'll let you pause the video and read these. And I'm interested in feedback and more examples. Here's an example of a shot gather with NMO this has a lot of scattering distortion on it, and this is with the full waveform correction. And you can see a lot of reflections are now apparent. 
that weren't apparent before. I mean, you have hints of a lot of these reflections beforehand, but they come out a lot better after the full waveform correction. So the full waveform correction isn't perfect, but it doesn't need to be. You can see this is still a lot better here than it is in the input. Now it's interesting comparing the different types of land seismic noise types. And what's interesting here is a lot of acquisition and processing is focused on the first three types. But I argue type four and five here are actually more important. And we haven't addressed those because we haven't known how, but now I propose some new ways of addressing these. And there's also number seven, organized passive noise, which is actually also somewhat significant. So I've reviewed three theories of land seismic acquisition. I'm proposing that now we have enough sources and receivers to optimize both deterministic and statistical filtering using irregular sampling. And this is focusing on the scattered noise both. Combining deterministic filtering and statistic filtering has some synergy. Statistical signal enhancement works best when the noise is random but the noise is not fully random. Deterministic noise attenuation works best by taking advantage of the patterns in the data, which is the opposite of random. Each method works on different types of noise, so they're complementary. Thank you, and I hope you found this interesting. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've seen that I'm trying to address some fundamental issues with land seismic data. It's not actually easy. I, I do want feedback, and I'm interested in help. Thank you very much.